this is going to be kind of a fun talk for me to give because it's a little bit of a, a, a lecture on surveillance uh, methodology and science and a little bit about policy and a little bit about the collaboration on the PIN, uh, the, the pilot project that Paul described. Um, so as, as Jim said, I'm the director of the National Surveillance Unit. Our unit uh, does a lot of things. Our vision is building partnerships and leading change. Um, it's a lot easier to write that on the top of a slide than it is to actually do that, um, but we work to, to achieve that. We have a lot of expertise from our statisticians to our uh, epidemiologists and economists, and um, so we cover a lot of bases. We also cover a lot of species, uh, swine being one of the major ones that we work with. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is using risk factors and probability to get the most information at the lowest cost. And um, as Paul said, there are a lot of budgetary issues. There are a lot of things that are um, inhibiting what we all are trying to accomplish. In some ways, that's a good thing, though, because as the budget shrinks, uh, it's a time where there's a lot of motivation for everyone to think differently about the, the uh, uh, ways that we've done things before and how we can possibly do them better. So the, the, the question, this is kind of a no-brainer question, is, is why do surveillance? And um, the, um, I think for the swine industry in particular, there's between four and five billion reasons for that in our export markets, and there's another three or four times that many reasons uh, for surveillance in our domestic markets. Um, the cost of federal and state budgets, uh, those are other reasons that we need to do surveillance, uh, think about surveillance differently than we have before. Uh, our budgets, I, I think in, in government, anybody who's worked in government, uh, shrinking budgets and budget crises are kind of an everyday thing uh, forever and ever. The last couple of years, though, it's been a lot more serious than I think I've ever heard it before because the budget crunches are, are real and the dollars that we have to spend are pretty stretched pretty, pretty, uh, pretty tight. So um, if you haven't figured out so far, what I'm going to talk about is pretty uh, simple based concepts, but I'd like you to think about the concepts anyway because the concepts reach a little further. Uh, think about what is surveillance. Surveillance is about finding disease, but if you don't find it, it's about proving that it's not there. So if you think about the trade markets, if you think about our exports and our market access, for the most part, those aren't about the diseases we have. Those are, uh, those are about diseases that we don't have and the ability to prove that we don't have them. Surveillance is evidence. and. So if you think about surveillance, we, we normally think about testing pigs or uh, samples or so forth, but surveillance, uh, the information we gather for surveillance is actually evidence to prove to other people. Uh, when I started working with veterinary services, one of the things that was pretty uh, hot topic, I guess, was back in 1994, the World Trade Organization uh, General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs one of the things that came out of that agreement was the SPS agreement, and SPS was maybe is, if not the primary, one of the very few existing non-tariff trade barriers uh, in animal products. And so a lot of the things that we find ourselves in veterinary services dealing with are the other countries and imports and exports. And the thing that I think has changed uh, very dramatically over the last uh, at least 20 years and probably more so in 10 years is that those of us uh, like myself, like Paul, like a number of you, uh, the experts, it doesn't carry very much credibility anymore. Uh, if we don't back ourselves with evidence, then everybody's got their own expert and if, if you don't have the right expert, then you spend a little more money and go hire a bigger expert. So surveillance evidence uh, is probably more important today than it's ever, ever been in these markets that, we, um, that we're uh, working for. Um, 
I put this slide up. This this guy, Reverend Thomas Bayes, uh, he lived back in the mid 1700s, and he did some pretty cool things analytically. Uh, he was a, a reverend. He was a member of the clergy. And at that time, people didn't have nearly the job spectrum that we have for ourselves today. Uh, the, the soldiers, they spent most of their time out hacking on each other with swords and axes. And uh, the nobles, they had lots of parties. And the peasants spent most of their time trying to make a living. Um, but the clergy, other than their soul-saving obligations, they were in a position to think, to think about uh, new ideas and, and thoughts and uh, how to do those. And what Reverend Bayes thought about was how to combine different pieces of information, different streams of information. Now, for those of us who are veterinarians, that's kind of second nature because when you, uh, in clinical practice, when you go to diagnose something, uh, your natural process is combining the, the history that the producer tells you and the, uh, the, the, the environment, the, the biosecurity, the way animals are kept, the feed consumption, so on and so forth, clinical diagnosis, and then maybe you put together some hard data. So Reverend Bayes developed some mathematical ways um, to think like a veterinarian, I guess is how I would put it. A lot of the things that we talk about in the surveillance unit, uh, the project that Paul just described, are about combining different sources of information to reduce the number of hard samples that we get. Um, hopefully no one in here is a statistician because I'm sure that I will offend you with some of my uh, simplistic uh, approaches to how to, to um, do statistical analysis. But um, if you are, just please cover your ears. Evidence may be a combination of sample testing, but also about those other things, about the knowledge of the animals, about the risk factor, about um, all of the different bits of information and data that can go into um, arriving at the conclusion. So on this slide, I put this in. Um, Paul talked about risk-based surveillance. Uh, we talk about it every day. I don't like the term very much. Uh, we've had a lot of this last year, particularly a lot of back and forth with some of our uh, counterparts in the UK and in Australia and in Europe uh, about the term risk-based, and we all seem to use it differently. So risk and the classical definition for risk assessment is a likelihood combined with a consequence. So if you're talking about PERS, the likelihood's pretty darn high. Uh, consequences are plenty high enough but they're not nearly so high as uh, perhaps a foot and mouth disease or a CSF or ASF outbreak. Um, when we look at targeting surveillance, uh, we want to collect samples um, where we can most likely find something. So we may want to look at samples where animals are most likely to get the disease, uh, where they're most likely to have it, or maybe for some given some uh, other information where we're most likely to detect it. So if we can do our surveillance testing, our samples, gathering the, the data, the number data, and combine that with some other information, then each of those pieces of information contribute and reduce the amount of the other. So if you know something about the animals you're, you're, you're selecting, then you don't need to test nearly as many that's a fundamental in the pilot project that we, we just talked about. And then the bottom bullet here is a definition of risk that I particularly don't like, and that's the definition of risk when people talk about risk and surveillance in terms of uh, dangerous to people. So I prefer to talk about probability-based surveillance rather than this kind of vague risk term. So let's talk about inference. Inference is what we're trying to do with surveillance. We're trying to go out and gather some sort of information, some knowledge, some data, some um, uh, maybe research literature, uh, and draw a conclu conclusion about our population from one or more pieces of the evidence. So remember that that's a little different definition than the statisticians use. Um, 
when we when we do testing, if you're a frequentist statistician, then the rules you follow is that the only thing you know is a set of numbers, the set of data. Um, when I have statisticians on my task uh, on my staff, it takes me sometimes six or eight months before I can thoroughly corrupt them away from believing and thinking like statisticians. Um, the um, I'm serious about that. I'm not kidding there. Um, the kind of sampling that, that we do, uh, we can do convenient sampling, which is simply what it means. We gather whatever samples are easiest to get. The problem is you can't do um, inference or not very easily make any kind of inference con from convenience because they don't represent the population. Random sampling, uh, that's a lot better. You draw the numbers out of the hat and then you test those animals. By definition, random is representative of the population. Uh, unfortunately, random is not always easy to do, so there are some other alternative ways that we achieve representative sampling. So random selection, um, inference, no matter how we're making inference, is in one way or another tied to randomness. So even, even when we talk about our targeted surveillance, uh, it has some basis in random theory. Uh, in order to do random selection, random surveillance, you need a listing of all subjects, a uh, sample frame, so that you uh, know what numbers to pull out of the hat. When we have over 100 million swine in the country, then that's pretty darn hard to have a, a listing of all those numbers in a hat to pull them out. The key point on random selection is that each animal has an equal chance of selection proportionate to its existence in the population. So if you have animals that, for one reason or another, are more likely to be selected than other animals, then that's bias. That influences the inference you draw about the population toward those animals that are more likely to be detected. So that gives you false information. That's not something that we want to achieve. So just a, a, a rule of thumb to stick in your pocket for next time that you have uh, statisticians telling you stuff, and I'm, I'm a bit of a statistician myself too, so I'm not totally insulting any of you who are, but uh, when you're talking to the statisticians and they're throwing numbers around, rule of thumb on a sample size to detect a disease is that it's 3x when you want to detect a level of 1 in x. So if you want to detect a level of disease at 10% uh, or 1 in 10, then you need about 30 samples. Or if you want to detect 1 in 100, you need about 300. Or 1 in a million, you need about 3 million. So there's, there's lots of other things that go into that. But if you stick that in your pocket and you're in the bar at night talking to somebody who's statistically oriented and you can whip out some uh, statistical sample sizes without seeming to think too hard about it, um, you can really fake people out. Uh, representative uh, sampling, um, the goal is that it's non-biased, that it represents the population. A representative sample could be just about anybody that you selected. Um, and so if it's not a random sample, then the challenge is having the information, the knowledge, to know that it's at least not biased, that it's not influenced one direction or another toward what you're trying to prove. So the first thing in representativeness is the population. And if we're talking about swine, and that's all the information you have, swine could be lots of things. Uh, in this slide, I see a smiling sow, it looks like. I see a pot-bellied pig. I see a ham sandwich. I see some nursery pigs, it looks like, some feral hogs. There's some dancing pigs and a sad-looking cartoon pig and a guinea pig. And so if I'm trying to, to determine some sort of population representativeness, I have to know what kind of pigs that I'm testing. I need to know something about what um, uh, production sector they're coming from, what uh, those pigs, um, something about their environment, um, how they're raised, um, whether they're indoors or outdoors, <coughs> exposure to feral pigs, uh, any of these other uh, non-statistical kinds of risk factors, 
and population demographics that help to draw that uh, conclusion and determine the representativeness. Geographic representation is important too. Um, if I were testing at slaughter, for example, it's not very likely, but it's feasible if I collected a, a sample of 100 pigs, I could be testing all the pigs from New Mexico and not testing anywhere else in the country. Um, that wouldn't be a very representative population. So having at least somewhat granular information about where they've come from is the second major component of, of population representativeness. Um, so I've said several times, and this is probably the most important thing that I'll say, is that to be representative, if it's not random, there's got to be other supporting evidence. So the thing that we're talking about in comprehensive swine surveillance uh, is the targeted or risk-based uh, or probability-based sampling. Uh, we're trying to find samples that give us more information than just the random sample. Um, the concept is that every sample you collect gives some kind of information. The corollary is that some samples are worth a lot more information than other ones. And so um, being a veterinarian, I always look for the best bargains and the best deals. I want the samples that give me the most information. Uh, if you think about the targeted surveillance, the samples that are worth the most, those are samples that are intentionally biased. They're not random, uh, but not only are they not random, they're biased toward certain, certain ones. But there's some catches, some challenges to intentionally biasing the sample. So to make inference from a targeted surveillance, uh, surveillance sample, um, one of the things is to clearly define the subpopulations. Um, you have to have that information if you're going to bias toward one subpopulation or the other. Uh, not just what they are, but the size of them. Uh, you have to know something about the risk factors. So if feral swine are a risk factor for pseudo-rabies, then what is that risk factor? How big is that? Uh, what does that mean? Um, the magnitude of it, um, the targeting also has to be representative of the subpopulation. So when you sample each targeted subpopulation, those samples can't be biased within that subpopulation. And you have to know the, re the relationship between those populations. To give an example, uh, this is a population, and these are people, not pigs. In fact, these are uh, Charles Schultz-type people. Uh, you can see Lucy there parachuting. You can see uh, uh, Charlie Brown walking a tight, we tight wire. You can see the little yellow-haired girl riding a surfboard. Uh, Lucy's watering some flowers, and it looks like Charlie's on a uh, soapbox giving a speech. So this is a population, and we've drawn a circle around it. So we have defined our whole population. We know uh, at least what's uh, not, what's outside of it. We've identified what's in it. If we wanted to take a random sample in this, depending on how big this population was, it might have to be really big. But if we wanted to do targeted surveillance, then perhaps if we had additional knowledge, if we had additional information, then we could separate the population. So on your right, uh, parachuting, tightrope walking, motorcycling, uh, walking to work in hurricanes and surfboarding are pretty high risk activities. And the people that are on the left are doing some more mundane things that are not very risky. So if we were in the insurance business and we wanted to identify the magnitude of risk in the population so we could charge premiums, uh, we might have done a random sample on the population, but we very well might use this targeted approach and take some samples from the high risk uh, individuals and some samples from the other. Now, if we knew that there was no way for the people on the left to have an accident, then we wouldn't even need to sample them. We wouldn't even need to consider them in our population, but they are in our population. So if we're talking about uh, pseudorabies, then our sows and boars might be the riskier population or pigs that are raised outdoors with fence line contact to feral swine might be our riskier animals. 
um, our uh, market hogs might be much lower risk. Um, if they were zero risk, then we wouldn't even need to consider them. Now, to draw inference, the one thing that we have to know is something about the risk factor. And there are some statistical and modeling tools that we can do to capture uncertainties and variabilities and ranges. Um, but if we happen to know that the people on the right are three times more likely to have an accident than the people on the left, then we can take a third as many samples as we would otherwise. Um, the total sample size then can be a whole lot lower. So this is this is a equation. This is a not a very heavy duty equation, but if we took 40 samples from a high risk population and they were worth three times as much as the others, then that would be worth 120 virtual samples. And if we took 10 low risk samples and they're worth less than than a random average sample, then that'd be five. So in this very simplified equation, we would take 50 tests that would be worth the information of 125 virtual samples. So the goal in the pilot that Paul had talked about earlier is to enable us to take a very much smaller number of samples uh, at a much, much lower cost and get the information that we need to achieve our goals of, of surveillance, to meet our international obligations, to uh, in some cases um, uh, maintain our consumer confidence to detect diseases if they're reoccurring in population and, and so forth. So the risk factors, we talked about intentionally biasing samples plus other information. Um, this looks like a pretty risky pig to me. It looks like uh, he's outdoors. It looks like the fence in the background is either non-existence or fallen down. He's not in a confinement. He very well may be, or most likely is, an area where there are feral pigs close by. So he's living a pretty risky lifestyle. So in Pseudorabies targeting, uh, sows and boars, we've estimated that they're worth uh, probably two and a half to five times as much um, as a, a general random sample. Exposure to feral pigs is pretty hard to estimate, but it's going to be high. It's going to be 10 times, 100 times uh, higher than uh, pigs that are, uh, say, in confinement. I don't know what the risk factor for confinement hogs are, but I know that it's really, really high. Um, we would collect samples from all population, and we'd remember that market swine, because they are the very, very low risk, would be worth less than one virtual sample each. So an example here on that um, additional information, that other knowledge that we talked about needing to uh, achieve our inference on our population and our understanding of the surveillance. Suppose that we had three herds of pigs that were uh, providing animals to slaughter. And one was really big and had 5,000, and one was 30, and one was 10. So does anybody remember the sample size to detect a 10% prevalence? Um, it's about 30. So if we needed 30 animals from each of these farms, number one, if we knew which pigs were coming from which farm, if we had an identification tag uh, like the swine industry's um, pink tag system, and we were able to uh, scan those tags, look at them, we would only need 30, 30 animals from that very large herd. We wouldn't need to sample all of them. Uh, we'd need to test all the 30 in the middle-sized herd, and we'd have to test all 10 in the small to achieve it. So if we had that perfect additional knowledge, we need 70 samples. If we didn't have that and we were testing this 5,040 pigs coming into slaughter with no other knowledge, to be representative of those three farms, we need 5,040 samples. So correspondingly, the cost is pretty, pretty tremendous in the difference. Right now in Pseudorabies surveillance, in slaughter surveillance, uh, we collect samples 
from all pigs that have traceable identifications. So we collect the samples, we collect the tags. Uh, we're unable to sort those on the slaughter line. So those go to the lab and they're sorted there. Um, the only thing that we know on the tags, unless we uh, scan the barcodes on the, the PREM IDs and get that information, is the state that they came from. And our current regulations require uh, that 5% of the samples from each state are tested. So we scan those, we throw away all the samples we've collected except for the 5%. In the pilot project that Paul described, I won't talk very much about it because he did a nice job of describing it um, and didn't describe all of the meetings and discussions and uh, uh, times that we've spent working out details on it. Uh, it's a collaboration with the pork board and AS, uh, ASV and industry reps uh, with six state veterinarians who have uh, uh, agreed, not only agreed, have been eager to participate in it and veterinary services. The pilot project, um, we've developed an algorithm. Uh, if you remember the diagram that Paul put up that showed the, the processes, uh, the samples are collected, tags are scanned. Uh, we, uh, with, with those scanned numbers, use the zip code to put a granularity on the location connect that granularity with exposure to feral, feral swine, we have an algorithm to keep tabs on how many animals are selected. So if you're providing the 5,000 pigs to slaughter surveillance, those don't need to be tested. We don't need to test 5,000 of them. We need to test 30 of them uh, or some other small number. So we scan the ID, we combine in the algorithm with the location and the risk, target the number needed, and pass that back to the laboratory for testing. Um, the, uh, the end result then, the end result that we hope to achieve after this pilot, if, if we can successfully make all of these things come together, is that we save a lot of the money uh, that we currently are spending and not needing and use that money on other swine programs, other things that are of more, um, uh, immediate risk to our industry, uh, African swine fever, uh, emerging diseases, a number of other things that are happening.